Welcome to Heavenward TV. I'm David Servant. Miracles on the Broadway that leads to destruction. Stay with me. Well, it's great to be together once again as we're slowly working our way through the entire New Testament chronologically. Right now, we are closing in on the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. So if you've got your Bible, why don't you open up to Matthew chapter 7? And we're going to pick up uh, today a little review as we start in Matthew 7, verse number 12, because all this ties in together. And, you know, Jesus gave this sermon all in one, at one time, and the people heard it from beginning to end. But we're chopping it up, you know. Know, and it just hurts us a little bit to get the continuity of it. So let's back up and, you know, it's not going to hurt us to read something a second time that Jesus, the Son of God, said about eternal life, right? Right. Okay, Matthew 7, verse number 12. Therefore, however you want people to treat you, so treat them, for this is the law and the prophets. And then he immediately says after that summarizing a statement that summarizes basically his entire sermon, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. Okay, so what's the narrow way he's talking about? Because obviously it's symbolic of something. Well, let's read it in context. Uh, in the context of the sermon, it's about the way of holiness. Um, we could say more specifically, the narrow way is the way of treating others like you want them to treat you, because that's what he just said seconds before that, right? Okay, and, 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 and most people aren't taking that way. Most people are not treating other people like they want to be treated. They're acting selfishly. They're not thinking of others, they're thinking of number one. In fact, I remember years ago there was a book written, the title was Looking Out for Number One. <laughs> you know, it was somehow trying to make people feel better about being selfish. Sometimes we even hear people come up with a theology uh, th th that says our whole problem is this, we don't love ourselves enough. You know, they'll take something that Jesus said or something in the Bible like uh, love your neighbor as yourself and build a whole theology on that saying you can't love your neighbor unless you first your lo love yourself. That's what the Bible says. So we need to learn how to love ourselves even more. And a lot of us just don't love ourselves enough. And, and it's just a, a way of trying to sanctify uh, deeper selfishness. No, no, when the Bible says love your neighbor, as yourself. It's just assuming that everybody, of course, loves themselves. We are selfish by nature. We're born selfish. The little babies, they could care less about anybody. There's not a baby on this planet that ever said to its mother, you know, sorry, mom, you know, for, <laughs> for waking you up tonight <laughs> to feed me. Sorry, mom, for dirtying my diaper. I mean, little children think the whole world revolves around them. And part of the growing up process is realizing there are other people who matter. Uh, but still, people master selfishness. You know, it's almost an art form, and they don't care about anybody but themselves. And even when they do appear to care about other people, it's really just caring for themselves in disguise because they're hoping to get something uh, as a result of what they've done for somebody else. All right, so love your neighbor as yourself is not an admonition to work on loving yourself more. It's just saying, no, you are a selfish individual. You've got to undo that if you want to be pleasing to God. All right, and so that's the narrow way. And uh, it shows that Christians fundamentally are supposed to be completely different than everybody else. We're on the narrow way of treating others like we would want to be treated, non-Christians, they're on the broad way that leads to destruction, just loving themselves, following the selfish path. The kingdom of God and the future kingdom of God consists of people who love each other. Isn't that true? I mean, you know, it's so true from, from what Scripture tells us. The very first fruit of the Spirit, the very first evidence that, you know, indicates that the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us is that we love others. The, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, first of all, is love, then joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But the first one is love. These three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But what? The greatest of these is love. Jesus said, by this shall all 
men know you are my disciples if you have what? Love one for another. And so preeminently, supremely, the mark of the true follower of Christ is love for other people. Or we could express it this way, unselfishness. That's the narrow way. And Jesus is then warning us and warning his disciples then that uh, there are those who would lead them off the path of the narrow way onto the broad way. Uh, they already existed in Christ's day. They were the scribes and Pharisees, just religious, selfish, self-centered people. And they no doubt fit perfectly this uh, uh, description that Jesus gives next of the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ra ravenous wolves. They, they, see, it shows uh, on the outside they look good, but, the, but their heart is not right. They're selfish. When they look at the sheep, they're not looking at people to serve. They're looking at them as people to take advantage of, people that will enrich me, people that will do something for me. And we have so many of those kinds of preachers today. Just look at them as Christ told us. Look at their fruit, for goodness sake. What kind of fruit? Look for the fruit of unselfishness. Look for the fruit of love and caring for others. Yet we have Preachers on the TV that all they talk about is themselves and how you can be blessed if you will give to their ministries. And we have pastors by the multitudes today. Look at their fruit. Their ministry is just a pyramid built to exalt them and so that they have more power, more money, more authority, more respect. Those are the modern day Pharisees that Jesus was talking about, you know, when he was warning about the false prophets back in uh, his day to his contemporary followers. Okay, I'm passionate about this, uh, but I think everybody should be passionate about this. Look at their fruit. Are they loving? Do they care for the poor? Like Jesus did, like the early church did, like the apostles did, like the Bible teaches. This is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father to visit orphans and widows and their strength. Where is that? Why, why is that not a component of many ministries today? I'll be right back. Okay, let's get back into Matthew chapter 7. We're just doing a little bit of review as we work our way through the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has 
been warning his followers now, stay away, beware of these false prophets. They're sneaky, they look like sheep, but their, their motives are all wrong. They're not looking for who they can serve, they're looking for who will serve them. And so just, you know, take time to listen to the fruit of the lips of, uh, you know, preachers and teachers and spiritual leaders and watch their lifestyle. Are they unselfish or are they selfish? Are they exalting themselves above other people or are they humbling themselves before other people? Are they serving others or are they expecting others to serve them? That's the characteristic of uh, the false prophet. Okay, now we'll just skip down through here because we've already covered this previously about, you know, good trees bear good fruit and bad trees bear bad fruit. But I have to point out one more verse before we go on, and that is in verse number 19 of Matthew chapter 7. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And so if that doesn't uh, make it very plain to us that there's a correlation between how we live our lives and whether or not we uh, ultimately attain to heaven or are cast into hell. I don't know what is. Um, there has to be fruit or the, you know you get thrown into the fire, a clear reference to hell. The same thing is said in Jesus' uh, little parable of the, the, the vineyard, the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches and so forth. Every branch in me bears fruit, every branch that does not bear fruit, he cuts off, and what happens? Those branches are thrown into the fire. And so true Christians now, and I, I say this over and over again because the Bible says this over and over again in, in so many ways, true believers are changed people. They are people who have been born of the Holy Spirit. There's no way the Holy Spirit can come inside of you and not affect how you live. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And so he's there primarily to do one thing, to make us holy. And what is holiness? Is holiness having your hair in a bun and having your, your, the hem of your skirt, you know, that halfway between your ankle and your knee? Uh, no, holiness is treating others like you would want to be treated, loving your neighbor as yourself. That's the supreme characteristic of spiritual people. They're lovers. They're unselfish people. They care about others and they serve. Jesus said it in another way. The greatest among you must be the servant of all. And so uh, that's what God is measuring us by. That's what we're going to be judged by. Uh, James says that we'll be judged by the law of liberty, the royal law. It is the law of love. And, uh, you know, if you're following that, then you're okay. All right, uh, now into something new. We jump down to verse number 21. The Lord says, and this is not uh, a new subject necessarily. It's building on the subject that Jesus has been talking about. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did, oh, I'm sorry. I want to jump up. I skipped verse 21. That was verse 22. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Ah, we should all have that verse committed to memory because it's so important, it's so essential, it's so foundational. There is a correlation between heaven and holiness. How could it be more clear than what the Lord said right there? The people who will enter the kingdom of heaven are those who do the will of the Father. So there's a correlation, right? Uh, sin, people who practice sin as a lifestyle, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to go in, they're not going to enter into heaven. They'll be cast into hell because they're not doing the will of the Father. Now, people sometimes question and say, well, wait a second, does that mean you know, we are perfect? Well, again, you know, this is one verse out of many verses in the Bible. When we read about imperfect people in the Bible and so forth, that obviously uh, you know, God's grace was upon them still, and they kept a contrite heart and a humble heart, and when they messed up, they confessed it, or when they were disciplined by the Lord, they made the adjustment he wanted them to make and so forth. And we know the Bible says we all stumble in many ways, and, and if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, all that. But I'm saying there is a fundamental difference between those who are striving to do the will of the Father every day, every day. They, 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 you know, they're conscious of it all day long. And what I am doing right now, is it pleasing to the Lord? 
and we're sensitive to our conscience. We're uh, studying the word of God, letting the word of Christ richly dwell within us, abiding in his word, learning the truth, being set free, growing you know, in grace, uh, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's a life that's heading in the right direction. Whereas one who has never repented of his or her sins, one who is you know, not concerned every day and every moment of every day, what is God thinking of me right now? Am I doing his will? Am I pleasing? See, that's not a person that Jesus is describing here in verse 21, the one who is doing the will of the Father. Okay, so look at your life. Look at your life. Uh, we're going to all be judged according to our deeds, the Bible says. And why? Because the deeds, it's the fruit that, that, that tells the story of what's in our hearts. That's exactly why Jesus said in these previous verses, you'll know them by their fruits. That's exactly how God knows them, who's the who's really on his side and, and who's against him, right? Looking at, their, looking at their actions because belief always results in some kind of behavior that then exposes and betrays and reveals the belief in the heart. Amen. And then Jesus gives an example of some people who are going to be in that category of what he said in verse number 21. Many will say to me, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so point number one is that the fruit that we should be looking for in spiritual leaders is not the fruit of casting out demons, prophesying, and performing miracles. No, it should be the fruit of holiness and obedience to the commands of Jesus Christ. You got it? All right, great. I'll be right back. All right, let's get back into Matthew chapter 7 where in this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is warning his disciples as he winds this sermon down about uh, how they can identify false spiritual leaders. He refers to them you know, as false prophets, but they could be any false spiritual leader. He says you'll know them by their fruits. And it's very clear that it, he's speaking about the fruit of holiness. More specifically, he's speaking about the fruit of unselfishness because true spiritual leaders are holy people who love God and love their neighbor as themselves, right? I mean, the two greatest commandments, if a person's holy, they're obeying the two greatest commandments. And, and uh, unfortunately, holiness has been redefined in some circles, you know, and people like Pharisees major on the minors and, and uh, exalt doctrine above lifestyle and so forth. And we say, well, he's a great leader because he, he knows the Greek and the Hebrew and he goes deep, deep, deep into the word. Well, is he caring for orphans and widows? Did you ever ask that question? Is he laying down his life for the sake of the brethren? Is he making any personal sacrifices? Is, 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 is he living an exemplary life of, of devotion uh, to others and, and making sure that their needs are met and, and, and service? You know, that's the question. It amazes me how Christians so often are enamored with people just because they have, you know, apparently knowledge or some kind of special gift. Jesus warns about that very thing when he says in, in, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. See, they're, call, they're talking, they're calling him Lord. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, cast out demons. And in your name, perform many miracles. And he said, I'll say to them, I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Wow. Depart from me. Now, here's the, here's the kicker. You who practice lawlessness. See, that was the problem. They had maybe, uh, you know, miracles and wonders and signs, but they didn't have what was necessary, the real fruit, and that is holiness, obedience. They were lawless. And so they didn't make the great. Depart from me. I never knew you. Now, a lot can be said about the, the, that verse. I mean, it is astounding to think about that. People often question. Of course, I've questioned it too. These guys who are claiming to have prophesied and done miracles and so forth and, and cast out demons, 
Uh, did they really do those things? And if they did, how did they do them without uh, God's help? And, and it, or, or did they have God's help in doing those things? Why would God help unholy people who, whom he didn't even know? Okay, so I don't believe that God was helping people uh, perform miracles whom he didn't know, who were not his own. Okay, so there's only two other possibilities. Either their uh, miracles were uh, of some other origin than God, and, and if they were really casting out demons and, you know, really doing miracles, bona fide miracles, it would have to be by uh, the power of Satan. We know, of course, that, you know, in the final days, the Antichrist is going to be doing, you know, major signs and wonders by the power of uh, the devil. So, there, there, there is an element of the miraculous in false religions and in cults and in the kingdom of darkness. Satan will do what he can do to lead people astray. And if he can do that through convincing them that it really must be from God because it's miraculous, that's what he'll resort to. Uh, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is, uh, of course, that these people just thought that they were doing miraculous things. And I tend to think that's more likely because I've seen so much of that. Um, I have seen uh, people prophesy, probably you have too, where if you have any spiritual sense at all or any discernment, you know they're just prophesying out of their mind. Some of their prophecies are nuts. I mean, you know, a lot of them are just so vague that uh, it's just a bunch of mumbo jumbo and people will take little pieces and say, "Woo, you know, look, that did come to pass three months later, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you just wonder where these people have checked their brains because it's so obvious that these people are prophesying just from their own persons. Okay, I could prophesy right now, right? So could you. Anyone can speak and say, thus saith the Lord. Uh, and people can do that and think that they're prophesying for the Lord. They can be self-deceived. And the whole casting out of demons thing, I've seen that over and over again over the years as I've traveled around the world and been in churches and so forth. You know, people, people have deliverance ministries, quote unquote deliverance ministries, and everybody has a demon in the, in, you know, who comes every single time and they cast demons out of everybody. And people have been Christians, true Christians for all their lives, <laughs> you know, have 17 demons cast out of them, you know, in the name of Jesus. That's all, you know, baloney. Yet these people who do it appear to be sincere, but they're sincerely wrong, okay? They might think they're casting out demons, and they might even stand before Jesus one day and say, I cast out demons, but just because you yelled at a demon and someone rolled on the floor and, you know, threw up, that doesn't mean they had a demon. You can easily psychologically manipulate people. And when they say, well, didn't we work miracles, perform many miracles? What people are calling miracles today oftentimes is, is laughable. Just because you go down a line and touch people and they fall over, there's nothing miraculous about that. Psychological suggestion, uh, peer pressure, other things, factors come into play, pushing them, you know, and having someone stand behind them to catch them. All those things are suggesting to people, if you're spiritual, if you really have faith, you're going to fall over right now. That's not a miracle, okay? And other things. People have these dreams, and you know, uh, 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 things they call miraculous. They're not miraculous. And so there are tons of self-deceived people out there, ministers and non-ministers alike, who fit this description of what Jesus is talking about perfectly to a T. And they will be the ones who are going to hear Jesus say, I never knew you because you weren't focused on obedience and holiness. You were just as lawless. You, you, you know, in your private life, you were no different than anybody else. I watched you, you know, when you're in the hotels. I watched you when you were at home. I saw what you did with your time. I saw what you did with your money. I heard what you said when no one was listening, you know, and depart from me. You might have had a great ministry and made lots of money, but depart from me. I never knew you because you practiced lawlessness. That's sobering, serious stuff. Hope you'll think about it until we get together next time. Until then, God bless you, and I'll see you next time.